What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Community Voices. I'm your host, O. Today, we got a very special guest, the general himself, New York activist. Anything else I'm missing? Um, I actually, I rap a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Um, activist, hip hop artist, I call myself, I like to be called a raptivist. A raptivist, I like that, I like that. So we got the raptivist in the building. Uh, my song, how you feeling? I'm blessed and highly favored, King, and yourself? I'm doing well, King. All right, cool, so let's get into it. Um, <clears throat> so this week, you know, we got the news that there will be pressing no charges on the officers who shot Jacob Blake in the back. I believe seven times, correct me if I'm wrong. So <clears throat> we see this, you know, time and time again. And, you know, we feel like there's never any change. So what are your thoughts on the situation? What, what can we do to make sure like, you know, justice is served and, you know, people who look like you and I aren't just like gunned down every day with no, you know, uh, repercussions to it? Well, I think for me, you know, first of all, thanks for having me. And second of all, I think I think for me, you know, being actually meeting Jacob Blake's father and his sister, you know, and developing a, a relationship with both of them, and you know, understanding the passion that they have. I never actually met him, but just knowing who they are, you know, it's it's, it's an atrocity that, you know, that you can we can visual we can constantly just keep visually seeing videotapes of black men and women being gunned down, you know, unarmed and, and constantly continue to hear the same no charges, you know, just as in the Breonna Taylor case, you know, and I, th I just think for us, we can't, we can't get complacent. We can't get jaded. We can't just say, you know what, they're not giving us justice. So we stop fighting. You know, we, we have to continue to fight. Like we got to continue to make noise. We have to continue to advocate, to protest, to divest, to do everything possible to never normalize police killing us. You know, and, and that's what they're trying to do. I think the more it happens and the more that people hear that nothing is happening, it becomes normal. And, 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 and the whole goal of that is to stop that fight, to stop you from even thinking you can fight because you don't think you can win. You know, and, and I refuse so I refuse to adopt that narrative, you know. So I think at this time, every time they tell us no about something we know is wrong, every time they don't charge an officer for killing somebody when we know it's murder, you know, we have to be way more vigilant. vigilant. We have to be way more angry. We have to go out there with more energy. We got to continue to say, look, we never are going to be okay with you killing us. Never, there's never going to be a day that we're going to say, all right, you're not going to do anything anyway, so we're just not going to say nothing. That's not, that's, that's not a strategy. It's not a successful strategy. It's like hoping that a bully stops beating you up because you don't fight back. You know, just saying, well, you know, I'm not fighting you, so you should just stop beating me up. No, a bully is going to continue to beat you because his goal is to be able to beat you when he wants to. He gets energy off of being able to do something to you, and you can't do nothing about it. So we get, we have to address every bully like we tired. Every time this happens, we have to address it like it, it's a bully that we're tired of. And we're going to keep fighting until either the bully gives up and realize they, or either they can't beat us or they realize that they just tired of fighting because we done took every bit of energy out of them. For sure. And the thing for me is like, you definitely don't want it to feel normalized. Like, you know, when someone, you know, shoots school or like a church or even like shooting us and it happens so often where it kind of feels normalized and I feel like in other places those things are normal so like you mentioned like you know we don't want it to feel normalized or it's just you know regular everyday life we got to be able to you know stand up and continue pushing peacefully and you know let people know that we're not not going to back down you know because all you want to do is be treated equal. Yeah, and, and that's what it is, man. In our communities, and you know, black and brown communities, and poor, impoverished communities, we've grown accustomed to normalizing abnormality. Yeah. We've got okay with it. Like, yo, even though this is not normal, it's normal for us. So, you know, we're not even going to say nothing. Like, I wrote a book called um, I Know My Rights. 
Mm-hmm. And it's about the first 10 amendments of the constitution is just basically informing, it's, it's, for, it's for children, it's a children's book. And one of the things that I wanted to do when I wrote that book was educate our youth, right? Because I said that I had normalized at the age of 10, 11, growing up in high crime communities and impoverished communities, it was normal for police to just pull us over as we was walking home from school with our book bags and just get up, what y'all doing? Go through our book bags, search us. Like somebody said, somebody got right. And we just, we never knew that they were violating our rights. Like we had normalized being violated. Like we just would go, we, it was like, yo, the police searched us, you know, F them, this and that, and we'd be mad, but we didn't realize that they were actually violating our rights, that it was illegal what we was doing. Because we had normalized that behavior. So we can, we, we get, we become accustomed to normalizing abnormalities in our communities. And we can't, we can't do that anymore because that gives the people who violate us the impression that we're okay with it. Oh, so on to the next question. So help educate the people on the root problem of policing and the way they police black and brown people and people who look like you and I. Well, if, if you really want a, a real understanding, you look at what happened at the Capitol yesterday. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've done many protests in D.C. and just all over this country. And you know, and when we say that we're going to protest against police brutality, against the non-indictments of officers who've actually killed people, right? When we say that we're going to peacefully protest and we have a real reason to protest and we say we're gonna protest, no matter what we say we're gonna protest, there are armed guards, sometimes tanks, you know, the National Guard, they meet us with pepper spray, they meet us with bullets. They meet us. They we we did a, a protest in in um, Louisville, Kentucky, in which they met us with flash bombs and they met us with rubber bullets and all of these things. And we did. There was no level of a threat at all. It was just peaceful people walking down the block marching. We hadn't done anything wrong. So when you look at the mind state that they have when they engage black people, they automatically engage us as violent. They already said that any place where black people are gathered, do anything, they, there's a, there is a opportunity of violence, even though the reality is that's not our history. Throughout our history, we, we've never inflicted any level of violence, especially upon white people, that's just not we do we've we've done more harm to our own because we've been trapped in this you know this this maze trying to get out and we see each other as you know quote unquote ops or opposition so you're the person that's stopping me from being able to survive or being able to make more so i have to see you as an enemy so that's what we've been taught but as far as any transgression against whites that's never happened throughout history but when you look how they were able to storm the capital Thousands of white people were able to literally walk in to the, the Capitol, the, one of the highest, most important buildings in this world during a time when they had already told them that it wasn't going to be peaceful, when you've already seen them being violent. They, 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 you, they have video of these same people being violent every on so many different occasions. They had no preparation against violence. They didn't see them as violent. They don't see them as violent. They don't see them as a threat they, because they identify with them. They see their struggle. They don't, they have dehumanized blacks so much, right? And that is the culture of this country. So it's, it's natural that's the culture in the police department. The culture of the police department, when, you, when they show these slides of violent crimes and violent people to some white person who come from the suburbs who never really probably engaged in black, with black people, only visions they've ever seen of black people are robbers, killers, rapists, told that they're the worst people in the world. So when they engage us, they engage us with already a heightened level of fear for their lives. They've been taught that every time you engage a black person, you have to fear for your life. I don't care if it's a 12 year old boy with a a gun, I mean, a toy gun that's shooting, or it's a little girl that's walking down the block, or it's an old lady who has mental health. They have been taught that we are violent. So the way that they engage us 
every time they engage us, they feel like their lives are in jeopardy. Or some of them don't even feel like that. They just they just utilize that just to be able to, you know, impose their will or harm us. Because that is the culture, and that because that culture is accepted within our police department, within the, stru the structure and the fiber of the police. So that's why we are engaged. It's, it, you can't, it's no training can do that. What, what, what needs to happen is there has to be consequences. It's not you can train, you can't retrain racism. You can't retrain that. You have to have consequences. You have to say, okay, I know that you might not like this person. Or you might think this, but if you do something to this person, you can lose your life. You can lose your freedom. You can you can lose your job. So there are consequences to this. So until there are real consequences for for you know violating the civil rights of black people, killing black people, beating black people, it will never stop. Right. But I feel like no one's born racist, but I feel like like you mentioned just the environment and you have like, you know some things that are passed down to your family as well. Like you mentioned, like if you're, if you're watching TV and you see like constantly seeing black people who are just like killing, rapists, stealing, whatever the case may be, then you're growing up with all those images in your head and they, you know, that's the next person being like, you know, being a police officer who thinks that way. So I feel like it comes down to really just education and just an overall understanding of, all right, this is not how this person is just like naturally. Like we should be able to look at each other and have that same feeling as you do for this person, as you do as this person without like any biases or anything like that. Yeah, and, and first, before you can do that, that, before you can have empathy for someone, you have to see them as human. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have dehumanized black people. A lot of, you know, other ethnicities have dehumanized and it's just not white people, there are other ethnicities that have dehumanized black people. They've been taught that we are not human and that's they're somehow innately better than us. You know, and that's 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 a, just a, a reality that we deal with in this country. And there has to be a retraining of that mind state. And as we retrain that mind state, there first has to be the consequences for doing something to harm or take the life then you start to see him as a human. Because if you can constantly kill somebody and there's no consequences, then it's just like you killing a rat or a mouse and you can stomp them out. You know, if people stomp rats out all the time because there's no consequences to killing a rat. You know, they do it all the time. So when there's no consequences, then they don't see you on an equal playing field as another a white person who if you do something to their life or you even, the threat of taking their life will have you dealing with levels of consequences that is unmeasurable. For sure. And then let's go back to Capitol Hill. Uh, as we saw like all the insurrectionists storming the Capitol building. And, you know, for me watching it, it just is so crazy because, you know, it's a building like you mentioned that's highly protected, highly guarded. You got a, a bunch of like government officials in there who are really sitting there creating laws and, you know, passing bills and things like that. And, you know, based on the images I've seen it's almost like I seen one video when like one of the officers is holding the hand of a woman and bringing her back outside. Her back up, and she's already, and she already violated and, and yeah. trespassed and desecrated the Capitol. They right. hold it. Like, you know, the country is the world's. Everybody's watching what's going on. But that's you know what the thing is. It and for me, right, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Because what happened is. That old man, I mean, that man see that old elderly woman and said, this is an elderly woman. She could be my grandmother. She's a human being. And I, I damn, maybe I don't feel that was that she she had any ill intentions. And I just want to make sure she's safe. Now that's 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 empathy. That's human, that's human emotion, you know. And I might have that same emotion, right? But the reality is they don't have that emotion for an older black women. If an older black woman was doing that, she'd be getting thrown to the ground, her face would be on the ground, it was pepper spraying her. If she did nothing, if she just was standing around. So that's what I'm trying to say. We don't we don't want you to shoot them like you do us. We want you not to shoot us like you don't shoot them. Exactly. Yeah, you know, that's all we're asking for, you know, equality really. Because you think about if you know, if, if if it was a BLM protest outside, it would have been one million 
um, you would never got on the steps. I, I'm telling you, I, we've done. It's not just BLM. I mean, just not the organization BLM, but just, a, 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 you know, a, a march or somebody a protest that was speaking in regards to Black life actually mattering, and not just the organization, but just any organ, any march that participated with the participants and the patriots was Black people. There would have been you would have not got on those Capitol steps. You just wouldn't have gotten on those steps. It's no way. I've seen it. We've never got to the Capitol step, ever. And it's just like so glaring the the difference because you see people inside with their feet up on desks, you know, stealing podiums, like chilling, picking up the phone, taking pictures, like you know, like they're just in the building, you know. And it's, it's called white privilege. It's, yeah. it's it's believing that this is what this is okay. Like you, you violate. If, if a black person did, they be trying to hide, duck their face. They don't want you to see them. They doing everything because they understand there are consequences. We made a, we made a decision. We going in here because I know once we walk in here, we might do some Fed time, five, ten years. I ain't trying to go to jail. White people have been protected and you know shielded from consequences in this country. A lot of white people have been shielded from consequences for so long. They don't even believe that those things exist. So take us through your organization and uh, help educate our viewers on what you're doing with your organization. Well, Until Freedom is an organization formed, co-founded by myself, Tamika Mallory, Linda Sarso, and Angelo Pinto that focuses on direct action for, against police brutality and civil rights violations. You know, we, we created this organization with being in this field, I've been in this field for probably the last eight or nine years. Tamika's been in it for over 25 years, Linda 20 plus years, and Angelo for, you know, probably equal about 20 years of doing his work as a, you know, attorney. And we, we wanted to create an organization that represented who we were. You know, we see that there are so many legacy organizations which we stand on the shoulders of. We came from an organization called The Gathering for Justice in which we also formulated an organization within the Gathering for Justice, which is Harry Belafonte's organization called the Justice League NYC, which we were, you know, we were um, also instant, instantly replied and activated and motivated on behalf of police brutality and child incarceration and things of that nature. And, and we did a lot of work there, but we, we, we wanted to form, when we formed Until Freedom, was something that represented our culture, hip hop culture, you know, which which spoke to the voice of what it is now. Like when we look at NAACP, which is one of our legacy organizations, and you say the NAACP was formed at a time where there was a specific need, you know, and and and, and the the pillars of that organization, the foundation of it fit the specific need. And yes, it's evolved throughout the time, but the, the, the foundation of it was the time that it was founded in. You know, and a lot of our legacy organizations, that's what it's, 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 you know, foundations are. But there has not, for me, there was no new organization or current organization that really encompassed our culture, that, that looked like what the culture was, sounded like, that was hip hop orientated, that had, that, incorporated the fashion of our culture that, but also incorporated what was needed by black people what was needed by our youth that made the youth feel like you know what this this fits me like you know i don't i don't necessarily have to wear a suit you know i don't necessarily not have to go to the strip club because i like to party and i don't have to not like rap music i don't have to have this clean cut look or image to want to fight for what's right for our people so that's what, that's what Until Freedom was. It's like, come as you are, but come with the same energy that you want. You want what's right for our, what, what's right for our people. You want to see the change. So you want, you're willing to fight Until Freedom. So that's what we wanted this organization to encompass. And, you know, we've been doing ever since we formulated in the last year. You know, we, we've been on the ground for Breonna Taylor. We went and actually relocated and lived in Louisville, Kentucky for three three to four months. And we were 
hands on and every day with the family and the grassroots organizations there who've been fighting prior to us getting there. We learned so much from them. You know, we tried to empower them and educate them about skill sets, about organiz organizing, but the passion in that city is immense. And we learned so much from them. And, you know, we're actually trying to build up organizations within the grassroots organizations who have always been there and also, you know, hopefully a chapter of Until Freedom there. We also were on the ground in Minneapolis for the George Floyd, you know, in which we were there in Ground Zero when everything took the day after George Floyd was killed. We were there for a week on the ground with his family and those grassroots organizations and all the organizations there. And, you know, and our motto is, you know, we want to uplift the voices of the grassroots organizations because that's where we come from. We understand that there are organizations on the ground in every city state here who are doing so much work that haven't been heard, that don't have resources, that don't have the platforms that we have. You know, sure, we do. We, we have our, we're based out of New York City in which we do most of our work, but we realize the need to be able to go to Louisville, and Kentucky and find you know, organi organizers who who otherwise would not be known outside of their circumference, outside of their city, or otherwise would not be have the resources to do the work that's needed. So that's one of the you know one of the um, the jobs that we've taken on and what we wanted to encompass in until freedom. But all, basically, man, we just an organization that's willing to fight for our rights and until we actually get freedom. And that's where the name comes from, Until Freedom, that we're pretty much going to fight until we get freedom. Cool. So, you know, with the community voices in this series, is basically to help elevate, you know, stories of yours, especially the work you're doing with your organization, and really help amplify, like, uh, the voices that come from our community. So, you know, love the work you're doing. And the amazing work, you know, you and your team are doing as well. So you want to be able to make a donation to help you guys continue that fight to untold freedom, um, especially if you were taking the time out to help educate our audience as far as like what's going on between this week and the work you've been doing to help just just to continue to fight for black and brown people to make sure, you know, they treat us equal and they're not their rights are being violated. So definitely want to donate to you and thank you for the work you've been doing. Well, I truly appreciate that. My organization appreciates that. You know, but I do, I want to make a little, a small clarification. We hate the word donation. You know, we like investment, you know, because donation means that you're just giving somebody something. We want you to invest in our work because you believe in it. You know, and I think words mean things. I think when you say invest, when somebody invests in you, you feel that you have an obligation to do something for that investment. And that's how we want, we want you to hold us accountable. We say we work for the people. So every time somebody gives us something, we don't see it as a donation, as charity, as you're doing something that you, we saying, we see it as you actually believe in the work that we're doing and you're making an investment into our freedom, into our equality and into our equity. So thank you for your investment. We truly appreciate it. You know, we're like, uh, I believe 27 episodes in and uh, we invested over half a million dollars to different charities and you know foundations and organizations that uh, help people who look like you and I with you know whether it's through education, nutrition, uh, knowing your rights, things of that nature. So I actually like that investment. So because you want to be able to nurture and hold these communities accountable for the work that they're doing. So. That's right. Definitely appreciate it, man. I'm mad. I was going with my do rag, and I see you got yours on. See, that's that. You know, I'm like, Jack, I was going to throw my, let me try to look a little professional, but I got the Until Freedom sign, so cool. I had my do-rag on all day. I was like, Jack, I don't even feel like taking my do-rag off. But, you know, at least. I, the very the first episode we did, it was like right in the middle of the pandemic. So, you know, my hair is like rough. So, <laughs> the episode we did was the IG Live with Terrence J. And I just had my do-rag on because I had no haircut. And, you know, it's just. Okay, so that's your thing. Okay, I listen. I listen, I love it, man. And that's that's what until that's what we represent at until freedom. Come as you are, as long as you do the work, it don't matter how you come. Right. And that's why I love finish line JD because even even though I'm giving you this opportunity to kind of to host these uh episodes, but on top of that, it's like they don't care if I'm wearing my do rag because it's just you know 
Because it's real and it's authentic, man. That's what it is. It's about authenticity. It's the authenticity for me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. That wraps this episode of Community Voices. Again, thank you, my song, for tuning in and sharing your knowledge with us. And yeah, that's it. I'll let you, you know, make the closing remarks with whatever you got going on and let the people know. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you, man, for having me. You know, thank you for the investment that you made in my organization, which basically invest in our future, you know, and I just employ anybody, everybody out here, man, just do something. You know, it's a lot of people who don't know the entry point into this movement, into this work. They see stuff that happened at the Capitol. They see, you know, no justice for Jacob Blake. They see no justice for Breonna Taylor and they feel like they don't have any way to do anything. They feel like there's nothing they can do you know, there is something you can do. Everybody has an entry point in our salvation, in our equality, in our fight for to evolve and to, to actually be treated as human beings, man. So it's not it's not it's not as much like I say all the time, man. What you have, all you got is all we need. You know, you just gotta find your way. So we are people sometimes that, that give investments to, to fund the movement. You have those who do be on, on internet, who retweets things so they inform other people about things that's going on. You have those that sometimes they cook when we can't cook. You know, we get to certain places and they have housing and, and, and lodging for us. Like there is a way into this movement. You just gotta find yours and make sure that you utilize your voice and utilize your platform and utilize your heart to get this work done. Yeah, nothing's gonna change overnight. So you gotta make sure to keep fighting and make those be chipping away at it, you know? That's right. All right, I don't wanna take up too much of your time, but I should rock with this episode. Again, thank you so much for tuning in with us. And I appreciate you, King. Thank you for having me. All right, cool. Peace, King. Peace.